I could talk to you. Yeah, Myra's. Her mic is really loud. Okay. Welcome to Tabernacle Live Church. Uh, thank you so much for thank you for joining us. Um, we are happy to be here today. We are happy to have you with us. Um, I am going to just lay the land, lay give you a little bit of the lay of the land here. Um, obviously, I'm Taylor, and next to me is the brilliant and fabulous <laughs> Miss Myra Herring. Um, my brother David Herring is in the back doing the switch, handling all of the technical things for this broadcast. Today we're coming to you um, with a extraordinary woman, um, a woman of great uh, knowledge, integrity, and uh, just keen astuteness, if you will. I agree, yeah. Yeah, she is uh, quite sharp. Um, she has a resume um, bigger than the biggest church here in the <laughs> land. Um, she works with a number of wonderful people like myself, like uh, Myra, mm -hmm. also um, big executives from brands that we all know. Um, so no name dropping, but um, you're in for a treat. We're going to be talking about um, self-awareness. You're going to understand some things around that and her business and her brand and how she got it and so on and so forth. Um, but without any further ado, let me introduce to some and present to others our lovely, beautiful guest, Miss Tia Buckham White. Hello, Tia. How are you today? Hi, how are you guys doing? Doing good. well. Good. So good to have you here, Tia. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Ta Taylor gave you uh, a great introduction. Um, the name of your company. <laughs> I know he. It's it's like then you have to live up to all of these things. Oh, Myra. Um, no, I, but I, I I know you can. Um, so your company, Notre International. I know you'll tell us more about that. But maybe we can just start by you kind of le leveling for those who um, are joining the call. And again, thank you all for joining. Um, to tell us what you do with your company. Maybe tell us um, how it started and, and what it does, what it offers. Okay. Um, and again, thanks again for having me and, and, and hello to everyone that's out there listening tonight. Um, my business actually was really born out of my own pain and brokenness, actually. Mm. Um, I mean, it's kind of deep, but it really is part of where the business started. Um, it started back in 2010, uh, formally and incorporated in about 2011, but it really was started out of doing work. I've been doing uh, group work formally and informally with women, professional women of color, or about a couple of years before that. And we would just, we, all of us were either in therapy or mm. had, we're seeing our pastors and, you know, in some type of engagement around personal development um, or therapeutic work. And people would tell me some of the perspectives I would bring were well-researched or, wow, I thought about what you said. And they would say, you should make a business out of that. Mm. But I never really believed that for a couple of years. It took me a minute. Um, and so the business was really born out of doing groups with women because I was looking for outlets. I was looking for a way to connect with women that were authentic or connected or just on that same path of personal growth. Mm. And uh, then one thing led to another, and I put some other concepts together, and we started the company, Notra. International, and I was really just trying to be fancy with the name <laughs> in French. No, things ours. So the name of my business in English is Ours International. That's the name of the business in English. Um, and I really think it it really is uh, founded. The reason we started is because I didn't feel like there was anywhere to find community. Mm. Community meaning places where you could interact with people and have a true, connected, authentic engagement, where you could say, "I don't know the answer," or "I need help with this," or "Could you?" Do you know someone I can call? I just didn't seem like I was finding that. I would go to therapy. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you're talking to your pastor or you're talking to an actual, you know, mainstream therapist. Mm. And they can tell you how to heal your pain, but they don't tell you how to deal with your day-to-day -day struggles mm. or your day-to-day -day desires to grow and, and professionally be promoted or to accomplish goals, whether it's starting a business or getting a home or becoming debt-free or buying a car or finishing a, a degree. Wow. 
I, I was needing answers that are a little bit more tactical and specific. Mm. So the business is really more helping you deal with the day to day, not really helping you heal the deeper pain, but helping you understand yourself in a day to day way. I, I know I went around the block, guys. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so <laughs> if, if, if I could yeah. kind of sum that up, you are before the counselor if you would, or before the therapist, you are the, you go to the therapist to be like, okay, I really understand where my pain is coming from and what I got to do. You are, here are the steps, here's the everyday things that I, you need to do to implement what you got from your therapist. I think so. I mean, let me just jump right into the whole point of it. It really, for me, when I would go to therapy, I would, you know, I, I was very, I'm, I feel like I'm a very blessed person. I've been married for 25 years in July, literally 25 years in July. Congratulations. Wow, congratulations. Two children, thank you. You know, one's in college uh, in New York, and my daughter actually left with a ninth grade to go to boarding school. She wanted to do that on her own. We had nothing to do with it. Wow. And so uh, <laughs> she's up in New Hampshire in school. And, you know, I have raised children, and, I, and at the time, I, you know, I had young children, and I had a good life. I didn't really have a lot of issues, but... I struggled in my relationship. That's just the truth of it. I struggled in my relationship. Mm. And it wasn't that I was trying to be dysfunctional, but when I would go and talk with people about it, they couldn't give me an answer. Mm. You know, why was I interrupting people? Why was I aggravated by what someone said? Why did I miss the mark? Or why was I afraid of certain things? I could not get that answer. It would be the general thing. Just pray about it, which is nothing wrong with that. We all need prayer. I pray on a regular basis. Um, yeah. But the answers didn't help me tactically change the behavior. So, yes, I am before the therapist because I think there's a bridge between therapy and nothing, right? There's a bridge between getting counseling from your pastor, prayer, and nothing. So mm. understanding yourself helps you receive what other folks are telling you that have that spiritual connection of depth to help you understand your pain or the therapeutic understanding of how to understand your pain. It's a, it's a piece that we miss sometimes, and I think it's hard to receive it if you don't understand what's going on for you, mm. how yeah. you see the world, yeah. what you were taught, how you feel about what's going on. And we really help leaders deal with that. So whether it's on the personal level or the professional level, we help all the folks that we serve start with themselves. That's beautiful. Start with yourself, understand your why. Yeah. Why do you feel the way you feel? Why are you not accomplishing the goal you want to accomplish? Why do you feel upset every day? And we're not talking about clinical depression or mental illness. Mm -hmm. I want to be very clear about that. Mm. It really is the basicness of, you know, I'd like to be in a certain place in my life that I'm not there. I wonder why. Yes. We figure that out. Yeah. That's so powerful what you said um, just about understanding, you know, yourself and seeing that maybe you had a goal or something you wanted to accomplish and you're not there yet. Um, and I think about, you know, the piece of it doesn't have to be something traumatic necessarily of, you know, depression or something like that. And those are real things. And I, I definitely agree there's a space for, you know, therapy to, to address and deal with those right. things. But you could be someone that on the outside seems like they have it together and, you know, um, by measurement of society seems that they're successful, but still not inwardly feeling good about themselves um how I, yeah how would you know if i am someone you know interested in working with you how would i even know that i need help or what are some of the things that you kind of can use as ways to indicate that maybe something's missing well i think that your own perspective is your best way to figure that out right mm -hmm. so here's what i will offer if you're the person that reads a lot of self-help books or you always think about, is there an answer to fix this? Or you do, uh, you, you wanted to reach out and talk about a problem that you either felt uncomfortable or scared, or I don't want to be judged, or I don't know the answer, or who do I talk to? Or I don't want that person to know this or that. Mm. I think that that might be a great perspective for you to know that that might be something. What I find is that there are certain people that, you know, we think about, think about new ideas or new things that you hear about in life, no matter really what they are. But it's kind of like a bell ringing at the top of the hill, right? right. Some people hear the bell, they just lose their mind. They're like, oh my God, I hear this bell, I gotta go find it, and they go find it. Mm. Sometimes ideas are like, well, my friend is doing this thing and she's so happy or he's so happy, I'm gonna go follow them and go do that thing with them, right? 
it's not that you really get it, but they're seem so excited and you love or value them. And so you're like, I'm doing it with them. And then there are some people that just never have a desire to think at this level and their life is pretty good and they're great and they're yeah. fine with what they're doing, what their choices are. So I don't think that there's a, there, I can't give a definite, like, here's the answer to know if you need self-awareness. Yeah. But I do think if you have a hunger inside yourself to get more understanding about yourself and when you read a book or you read something or you come to church or you get a word, mm. it's not that does it resonate with you. It's not that that information didn't help you. It's not sustainable. It's not the change is not long lasting. Does that, does that resonate with both of you? Oh, like, absolutely. It's really absolutely. that. That's really how you know. Um, and if you hear someone talking about it, usually the people that are, are the most excited or engaged, they hear what I'm talking about and they're like, okay, mm-hmm. see ya. You know, and they, they'll call me. They'll, I mean, I get people that will hear me speak about this concept and they will sign up like in 24 hours or yeah. they will sign up in two days. Like it doesn't take a whole lot of conversation. Some people like to do their research. They want yeah. more information. They're kind of like, I think I know this problem I'm having. And I've been, I'm in, I've been in therapy for seven years or six years or four mm. years. Or I've, you know, talk with my pastor or, I, or the problem keeps coming up over and over again. Yeah. Or I can't promote it. You know, or I keep trying to go finish a degree, whatever level that degree might be, all the way up to PhD, but I can't. <laughs> Something always comes up where I don't finish it for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, it, it, it could also be I get women that want to be married. Mm. I get that a lot, too. Mm. And they can't figure out why they struggle in relationships. Mm. Right. Uh, I don't get as many men, but I do get a lot more women, specifically professional women or women in general that are looking to get an answer about maintaining healthier relationships or picking better partners. But that's all really about self. Yes. No matter what subject we're talking about, it really is about you. Because think about it. In every experience in our personal lives, we are the common denominator. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right? That's just mathematically factual, right? So if you've got 25 experiences and, and they're all either going great or not great or whatever, the only constant is you in it. It's true. So Right? And I think it would be hard for people, but I, I kind of... Think of it that way in terms of understanding yourself. I love that analogy. Because you're the common denominator. I love that. So I've been in therapy a, a, a good bit of my life, right? Um, in the latter part of my life, you know, very, very consistently. Yeah. And um, in therapy, it wasn't until, I don't know, the beginning of this year, maybe the end of last year, I really unlocked where the source of a lot of my pain came from. Um, And I was Mm -hmm. in therapy for a long time. I guess what I'm trying to say is if I was working on self-awareness, right? Um, If I was working on self-reflection, some of the things that you offer, would I have possibly come in contact with the source of my pain sooner? Because when you go to a therapist, you usually deal with Mm. what's at the top of mind. But in my coaching you know, or my time with you, you go straight to, okay, Taylor, these are some of the tendencies that I see, so on and so forth. What, what could you offer here? So, you know, my mind gets going guys. So keep me, Myra and and Taylor, keep me, keep me in the lane. I won't won't go outside the lane, you know, I'll get too deep, but that's all right. I I will offer Taylor that, um, yes, I think when I, I, I actually coach, I, I have talked with therapists, but I've co- I'm coaching a therapist currently, right? And one of the reasons that the therapist came to me to get coaching is because she wanted to understand self-awareness because I had sent several of my clients to say, hey, do you know a great therapist? And I would send them to the therapist. So she was kind of like, I want to know, I want to understand this. So the NOTRA method, which is the process I built to help you understand yourself and the self-awareness, Taylor, to go to, your, to answer your question, it, you're right. It does help you understand yourself. So let's say you've been going to a therapist for a certain period of time, and the therapist is only going to deal with what you put in front of them, right? Mm-hmm. They're only going to deal with the situation you're talking about and what pain you guys have discussed. But if you do think about uh, therapy in general, mm-hmm. what I've been told by the therapist in my life and the social workers that do therapy, that are licensed social workers that do therapy, it really does come back to they're only going to take you as far as you're willing to go. So if you don't want to talk about the thing that they may see that you need to talk about, they're not going to take you to that point. They're going to meet you where you are. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you go into therapy to focus on the question you're asking, 
understanding your stuff and your pain and like have a confidence about touching that, the therapist can take you where you need to go. Right. Or the pastor can take you where you need to go to help you get the healing because you're coming in with clarity about what's going on with you and the mm-hmm. patterns that are happening in your life behaviorally that could be limiting you mm. that might make you get more knowledge. Mm-hmm. I don't think that this the, the Notre method and the process I developed to help you understand self world is the way we talk about it. And Myra, you asked me to give a definition of what how we look at what self-awareness is, and I will yeah. do that. Um, it, it really does help you get where you're going if you have a knowledge walking in. I've had a few clients that I've said that, that have long-term relationships with therapists. I've said, when you go into your therapist next time, tell your therapist, okay, here's what I know. I know this, this, and this, and this about myself or your pastor. Mm-hmm. And say, but I really want to deal with what is going on here. You've mentioned this to me several times, or I feel uncomfortable when we talked about it, but now I'm ready. Yeah. And I will say to them, watch how your therapist or pastor acts when you say that, because they're used to people not wanting to go there, not wanting to touch a certain thing. But if you've had a long-term relationship, there are probably things that you probably might have struggled with or they might not have felt you were ready for. But if you give them the permission to help you heal because you understand yourself and what's going on for you, they have the life thing and the, you know, the ability to take you where you need to go and then bring you back emotionally and to keep you safe. Yeah. Coaching is not going to provide that for you. It will just provide you an understanding of what's going on with you relationally and what might be causing you some limitations. And that's why we say that we're that bridge between therapy and nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Not doing anything and just doing everything on your own and going to therapy. We're that bridge in between because we get you ready to really receive what the pastor or the therapist can help you touch emotionally. That, that I hope re- that answered it. That yes. really resonated. Yes, that resonated. And, and if I could just regurgitate to make sure that I understand and our yeah. audience understands, um, you help us see the everyday you know, you interrupt people, you're not a great listener or whatever it is. You're acting out for whatever reason. You have a pattern of bad relationships. This is what we notice about you. And then you take that piece and you go to your therapist. And instead of just talking about, I'm an angry, I I hate traffic in Atlanta Mm -hmm. for your therapy session, because you get to your therapy session and you upset, Mm -hmm. you know, you just talking about what's at top of mind. You go into your therapy session and you're like, I am a. I have bad communication skills. I blah 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 blah. I have. I'm an angry person. And then your pastor or your therapist can be like, okay, let's let's get to where that comes from, and take you there to that place, and then bring you back after you understand it safely, mm-hmm. so that you can operate in a different maxim of where you understand what that mm-hmm. is, where it's coming it, it, from. Oh, it, by the way, that's exactly the point. The point is for you to have the, there's the day-to-day life that you live and they're, you know, understanding what the notion method will help you do is understand your butt, like what triggers you. Mm-hmm. Are you aggressive? Are you passive? Are you conflict avoidant? Do you, you know, are you, do you use a lot of, uh, we call it in therapy, they call it victim language where you're like, well, you didn't let me do this or you told me I couldn't. And so I wasn't able to. And, and if he had just said it the right way, I would have known better. Yeah. All of that is blaming someone else for why you can't do something right. Mm-hmm. You can start learning those patterns in yourself. We have models that we've created. One that I created called the five A's of behavioral transition helps wake you up to things you're doing that you don't realize you're doing that could be limiting you. Mine used to be interrupting. I didn't realize that I interrupted people Mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I had an experience where someone with power told me I was doing it, and I was devastated because I didn't know I was doing it. And I felt so helpless because I was like, how do I fix something that I don't even know that I'm doing? Mm. And so it was hurting my friendship relationship, and I didn't know it because I had friends in my life that didn't feel comfortable telling me for whatever their reason was, right? Um, so it just, there were so many layers to me and that kind of opened my mind to like, yeah. you can't fix something you don't know you're doing it. And if no one in your life is empowered or comfortable enough to tell you, or if there are arguments where the stuff comes out, let's just really keep it real. Like yes. you have people that are just frustrated with what you're doing in there and you have an argument and then the stuff comes out, but you don't want to receive it because it happened in an argument. All of the notes are meant that helps you really see and understand yourself on the personal relational side. But let's yes. just bring it to the business side, the yes. having a job, going to work every day side. So whether you're an entry-level employee 
whether you're interim, whether you're about to go into leadership, whether you're an executive level leader or a business owner, mm-hmm. right? Or a business owner. Um, you can get a chance to see how your behavior is manifested and how others experience you. So let me go to what you mentioned, Myra, that you wanted me to get the definition of self-awareness. So yeah. the technical definition of self-awareness is just your understanding of self, mm-hmm. right? And it's the understanding of self that's deeper than just my eyes are brown. I like, you know, I like the color red. You know, I love oranges. That's a level of self-awareness. Then the deeper level of self-awareness is what you think about things or how you feel about things. Uh What we have to go to is more involved with how are you being experienced, which is really about other awareness, Uh right? But other people, how they experience you, not to be confused or conflated with what people think about you, mm. which is different. Ah. <laughs> what people think about you and how others experience you are two different things. Okay. They can get conflated for people, but really understanding the difference. We help you really get the difference in how you're being experienced and what other people think about you. Because what someone thinks about you is really more about them. Yeah. Right? But how someone is experiencing you is probably something that kind of transcends multiple people from different backgrounds and have a different perspective. They can experience you a certain way. Yeah. And we really do help aware of other awareness, which is rooted in more health, right? Mm-hmm. And connectivity to yeah. yourself. Yeah. So I that clarifying. That does. That's so we great. Were- yeah, I was going to, so you, you, you touched on, you know, relationships and interactions with other people. I kind of wanted to to get you to go in a little bit more depth about that, especially for our audience in how is self-awareness impacting relationships and, and you know, what is the, the things that people need to understand about maybe things that they're doing or things that they may not be self-aware about that could negatively impact their, you know, relationships with their spouse, with their family, you know, children, parents. What are some of the, the things that may be impacting relationships? Yeah, people would love to know about how to have better relationships. Spouse, well, I, boyfriend, well, boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend. That's, they well, would I love that. I think that, that that can be complicated depending on how you see the world, right? Yeah. Mm. But what I'll at a basic level is if you look in your own brown eyes every day or mm. green, beautiful hazel eyes or blue eyes or whatever color your eyes are, you look in those every day when you brush your teeth or just whatever you're doing, you know your truth, right? You know how you feel, whether you can admit it or not. Mm-hmm. We can we can we get the depth of that, right? And when it comes to relationships, we all know we have the relationship we want or the way we want it. Mm-hmm. The way we kind of help folks understand relationships is if someone is married or dating someone very seriously. Um, in a committed relationship with another person and they are complaining and they're not happy and they think the person is, you know, they're not, they're not really doing well. What we challenge folks to do is to start with yourself first and not look at what the partner is doing, but look at that and try to get them to come back to themselves. So there, there, there are situations we could offer, but we really, because everybody's self-awareness is so, it's like the way you look, right? Mm -hmm. You might look like somebody else, but you're still you and individual and, and different. So everyone's lens on how they see themselves or what they want for a relationship is different. But if I gave you a couple of basic things to understand, I would say from this day forward, if it resonates with you, go forth in your life and always start with, okay, how am I feeling about X? Mm -hmm. If you want want a relationship and you don't have one, start with yourself and say, huh, I wonder why I don't have a relationship. Just ask yourself that question. Good question. Why? Yeah. Right. Just why don't I have it, right? And if most of your answers are because men aren't this or because women aren't this or Mm. because partners aren't this, whatever your answer starts with the other person or the other thing, the other situation, then you already know you need to start with you. Yeah, that's powerful. Again, because you're the common denominator in your life, right? And... Oh, I don't want to get too complicated with it. With the come on, no, uh, no, this is good. Keep going. No, right. It can be true that someone has done us wrong. And when I was an undergraduate, I was in a horrible relationship. All of us have those undergraduate, you know, in college, bad relationships. Yes. Everybody has to leave life, right? Um, it was true that that person 
did me wrong, right? He 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 mistreated me. Mm-hmm. But as I've gotten more mature, and I've also been married for 25 years to the same person, right? Um, I can see where I played a role in some of it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't change what he did. Uh-huh. It doesn't change did me. It doesn't change that. But I can see the role that I might have played in it, which does not make me take the blame or take anything off of his shoulders if we were talking, if he and I were talking about this, right, yeah. in current day. So I think that could be a slippery slope of sometimes we're not aware that we really want someone to say, but they did me wrong. And it's mm-hmm. true, they did do you wrong. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the portion that's yours, like I, when I'm coaching folks, I might say, think of every situation in relationship as 100%, mm-hmm. right? There's 100%. You and Taylor are having a disagreement. There's 100% of responsibility between the two of you sitting on that stage, Mm -hmm. right? So let's say that you kick Taylor, right? (laughs) And then Taylor gets mad about that, right? right? It's a point issue. It will hurt. It's going to hurt. Exactly. That's why that's a beautiful point. And Taylor could say, well, I got up and left the stage because Myra kicked me. Right. Well, Taylor to leave the stage is about Taylor. Hmm. It's still true that you kicked him. But his choice to leave was about him. Right. That's Do you right. see that? Yeah. And that's a very hard walk when your feelings are hurt, mm. when you're upset, when you feel that people are doing you wrong. Yeah. But if you can gain that skill of really sitting and saying, you know what, 70% of that is Myra, but this 30% of me choosing to get off this stage and end this call in the middle of Tia talking, wow, I'm going to take responsibility. Mm-hmm. I could have made I could have said, hey, Myra, I don't appreciate you kicking me. Please don't do that again. Right. Or I could have said, if you kick me again, Myra, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to go get that. David because I can't get Any you. Any way it goes, there's enough understanding how to parse out responsibility. That's not a science really yeah. it's objective. But yeah. it's a way to get people to stop being so hung on how they were done wrong and take back their control of their own life, what they can control. Because yeah. you really can't control other people, as we know. You can't yeah. really even control your children. For those of us that have children, mm. we know that you can't control your children. Mm. Lord, help us all. Yes, Lord. So, um, I think that, you know, concepts can be a little difficult to mm-hmm. manage. So I, I try not to say it very cavalierly. I know that it's pain in that for some people yeah. and hanging on. But really the anchor, I believe, for doing this work is, are you where you want to be? Hmm. It's, are you good? Powerful question. We, what are you doing? Can you tell us what you're doing? Because we want to do it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But if you're not where you want to be, this process can help you get there, and it doesn't matter what it is. Marriage, a job, debt freeness, yeah. making more money, new ideas, starting your own company, yeah. changing your trajectory in life. It doesn't matter what you want. If you're not where you want to be, we feel that this process, the Notre Method and understanding yourself through self-awareness, is a great anchor to build on top. We, we consider it a, more of a foundation. Yeah. I think right? that's really powerful. We all think Yes, but you know, mm-hmm. our faith is a foundation, right? It anchors our life, right? Yeah. Um, we think about um, there are different foundations we have, and I think that understanding yourself is it, empowering because you have control of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can That's it. control that. Yes. You cannot control anything else. And when you learn how to do that in a basic way at the beginning of our process, our coaching process are usually six months for our um, – basic learning the notes method and that interim sometimes we coach um entrepreneurs but our mm-hmm. executive level coaching is usually anywhere from six months to 12 six to 12 months but what we want you to do is understand the basics so then you can go out there and deal with the more sophisticated problems or the more complicated nature of managing relationships or yeah. being more influential in your relationship as opposed to just accepting what happens to us mm-hmm. um mm. yeah. i think that you know so I can go on and on for days. Well, I, I, I think I heard body. something, Myra, uh, an audience. Basically, with with this self awareness, it starts with you asking yourself the right questions. Yeah. Or at least asking yourself any question, because most of the time, in my experience as an entrepreneur or as in leadership at church, people do not like to take responsibility. Yeah. They don't ask. They don't ask themselves the questions around, well, what did I do in this? Mm -hmm. What was my piece in this? How can I be accountable for my part? That is not how humanity, I mean, look at our president. 
He doesn't go about how uh, life about how can I take accountability for things. Today, he's throwing the who under the bus, albeit they have their responsibility. But as a society, I think Notra is powerful for that society because it tells you to ask questions about Yourself. you. Absolutely. And your example about Myra kicking me was brilliant. Myra kicking me, yes, 80%, 90% with that pointy shoe <laughs> is on Myra. But that 10% that I decide to deal with, you know, speaks to where I am at and how I manage my pain. Yeah. Where I'm at and yeah. how I decide to deal with the situation. Maybe if I don't know where my pain comes from, I get enraged mm -hmm. and I act like a fool. But maybe if I know where my pain comes from and I understand that I didn't have anything to do with her deciding to kick me, I can make a better choice about how I am going to respond. Yeah. And that starts. Yes. And, yeah. Yes. Even if we take what you just said and say, let's say you said something mean to Myra and then Myra kicked you. you right. See how the cycle can be. Yeah. You, you see I, how it can be my be, counselor told me. For their behavior. My mm. counselor oh, told me, mm -hmm. my counselor told me, Dr. Rosa McDaniel Ash said that victimization or drama is a, is a, is a cycle. It's a triangle. And, oh. And there's yeah, the exactly. victim, the, um, there's two other things with it, but it's a process and you have to just take yourself yes. out of mm -hmm. the dramatic process to not, to not continue to be a part of the cycle that is drama. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. if yeah. Myra's, and, and, if I said something mean to Myra and Myra decided to kick me, well, Myra is deciding to play a victim, but not only she decided to play a victim, but she's also deciding to play the, uh, what do you call it? The persecutor mm -hmm. by delivering the punishment. Right. And then exactly. and now we've got this cycle yeah. of drama going. Yeah. Yes. And and using by I mean, I know that kicking someone is violent if we're not promoting violence, of course. Um, but it is a great example that you can see it in your mind. But if we if we make it more complicated, just think of it like this. Um, you guys, have, I don't know if you've seen the Will Smith video where he talked about fault and responsibility. Have you guys ever seen that video? I haven't. I have not. Okay. So let's just talk about fault and responsibility, right? It, let, let's use it in terms of birth, uh, in terms of our parenting, right? Or being born, right? It's not our fault who we're born to. And if you're born to parents that don't give you what you need or get or are abusive, emotionally, mm -hmm. psychologically, physically, whatever leaves, right? Abandon you, whatever those things are. That is not your fault. No baby is asking for bad parents. No, no babies aren't born broken, right? Yeah. Unless they have some kind of physical ailment or mental debilitating something that is a problem, right? But in general, healthy babies aren't born broken. They're not born racist. They're not born hating people. They're not born My God. scared. Yeah. They're, not born they're not born broken, right? Exactly. They're not. Okay, so that's a hold, right? So your fault is, it's not your fault, right, how you were parented. You couldn't control that. Mm. But it is your responsibility on the life that God gave us. Yeah. That's your responsibility, Right. There's a difference between fault and responsibility, mm. Mm. right? Mm. It's not our fault that we were brought over as slaves to this country. Yep. That's not our fault, mm. right? But where we live, how we live our lives, it is our responsibility to be good for the future generations, which I think we have done a beautiful job as African-Americans, regardless of what the news keeps saying about us. Full, yes. We have risen and risen and risen and risen. I agree. No I matter overcome. what we have been through to get there. And I think mm. we've done a great with responsibility, no matter what the students keep telling us yes. every day about our
people talk about self-awareness now every other day for the last five years. You're articles by mm-hmm. big publications have been written about self-awareness specifically. Not as much in emotional intelligence, which is important, Yes. but self-awareness is part of the five pieces that make up emotional intelligence. And without the self-awareness, the other five pieces can't really work, it doesn't wow. work if you think about it. It's true. So, so yeah, while so, we have you here um, with this, how does this apply? And I'm, I'm sorry, Maya, I'm going to give you the floor. Mm-hmm. But how, you know, Tia, we have children. So how does this self-awareness apply with, you know, is this something that you can start up, start with your kids? How have... How has your journey and what you know about Miltra um, informed you how you parent your children now and maybe make you reflect on it in the past, like maybe you would have done some things differently? A lot of people in our audience mm-hmm. have children. So how could you uh, speak to that? Well, I think that conceptually, I've jokingly said that uh, we have these beautiful humans being born from us, right, in mm-hmm. these generations, most people then digital natives, and the, the generation after the digital natives, they're called uh, uh, XR, and it stands for cross-relational. Um, mm-hmm. They're going to be the first generation raised in um, virtual reality, being a part of their life from the beginning of their life for their whole life, right? Mm-hmm. So if they're born into this fourth industrial revolution, which uh, they're calling it, you know, 4IR, right? And uh, thinking about all of that, what I realized is that, you know, the generation that we were born into, for those of us of a certain age, we weren't necessarily given the same kind of parenting because time was different. Yeah. Even if you had the best parents that gave you everything you needed. To um, I'm not talking about material things. I'm just talking about love and safety. That's all yeah. I'm talking about, right? I'm not talking about material yeah. um, things. Um, they still were coming from their generation, correct? Yeah. So you are now raising a different generation so their needs are different than yours now that's debatable because me and my friends have had some very healthy hearty you know swash you know kicking and and, and jumping and, and debating conversations about i did it this way and i'm gonna do mine this way and that's how it was and that's what i'm gonna do you know what i mean so everybody has a different perspective on parenting but i believe if you raise a child with emotional stability mm. right you don't discipline from a place of anger Mm. really do discipline from a place of, and I'm not saying I've gotten it right because uh, we don't promote perfection with the Notre method. We promote knowing better quicker. That's all I we love promote. that. Mm. I love Just that. knowing better. That's, we're not, a, I'm not going to be a perfect caddy. Yep. Trust me and believe my husband will let you know if you get on camera right now. <laughs> I'm totally not that person. <laughs> and people can appreciate I'm, that. And my, yeah. Yes. Yeah, probably heard me and my son argue about the Wi-Fi when we were trying to get on the Wi-Fi. So clearly I'm not over here, you know, yep. playing the violin and singing my children, you know, choral tunes. Yep. Um, but I do think that I understand when I failed my children how to take a deep breath mm-hmm. if I need to, you know, get myself together and come back and do the right thing by them. So I think that's really it. I think material goods is gravy, but I think it's the emotional stability you provide your children. That is the most important thing around being self-aware. And so you ha- you can't really give that away if you don't understand yourself. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think you, you did give something. You, you did give us a little something. You said you don't, dis- you would, you, no trouble would be you don't discipline your children in anger. So is, would it be safe to say if Myra and I were in a disagreement on stage, we don't, you know, deal with our disagreement in anger, we try to deal with the disagreement when we're both level-headed? Is that a practice that you would consider going across the board? No, I really have to say, and I know this might sound like I'm all over the place, but I think it really is more about the two of you, right? Mm. So when you're in a business situation and you don't know people, I think you have to just deal with the standard social construct of what is appropriate. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. But in personal relationships, I think it's more about the platinum rule, not the golden rule. The golden rule is, and, was, and has been said for generations, treat people the way you want to be treated. Yes. That implies there's one standard way, and the way you see it is the way everybody else is going to see it. What we really promote is the platinum rule, which is really treat people the way they want to be treated. Ooh. Mm. I love right? that. So if <laughs> yes, it I like that. It is. I, I do like, like that. I do like that. <laughs> I love it. Right. And so use your example of you and Myra getting into an argument and you have a relationship with Myra. She's your friend. She's your, she's your brother. You know, she's your boy's 
why Why, exactly family basically Mm -hmm. really what i would what i really think is knowing who myra is and if myra's a talker and needs to get it out and can stay in it and is not offended by arguing then if that's your girl you know you got to stay in it but if myra is a person that doesn't want to argue and you know that it might overwhelm her to take care of that relationship then you give the gift of treating myra like giving her a minute does that make sense yeah so i look at children my son's a firecracker like me and my daughter is more laid back and outgoing i meant more laid back and introspective like my husband so when i'm disciplining my children me and my son because he's also 19 we can go at it you know we can get a little fiery with our stuff you know because <laughs> we're gonna last about it in five minutes and he's gonna love on me i'm gonna love on him because that's his personality my daughter is like look mom you've already told me that three times thank you mm-hmm. you don't have to say it again I appreciate that <laughs> and she needs a minute and there's nothing wrong with either way right yeah so there's taking care of a personal relationship and then there's social appropriateness of how we behave yeah so I think you have to that layer of presence and really being in the pocket of what you're doing Sometimes people don't agree with this perspective, but I find that when you can operate from some of these values, you gain more control as you move through your life, and it's a little bit of a stress reliever. That's great. Because you now have, you know? Yeah. I want to ask a question. It's coming from the audience, um, and I'm going to put my own little spin on it, um, around how far do you have to go back to really dig up these things to help you understand yourself? So. How much do childhood experiences and growing up as a child, you know, even as you were talking about how you raise your children and and you raise them to be emotionally stable, how much of that, if you didn't get that growing up, would then impact you as an adult? And how much of that impacts your, you know, as you, um, your current behavior as an adult and you look at this method, do you go deep into, you know, childhood uh, experiences and things like that? I think it's really about where the person is. So I'll give you an example. Um, depending on how someone sees their own experience, when when I'm working with them and talking with them, I'm asking them why. Like, I'll give you an example, Myra. I'm going to go around the block. So, okay. you know, respectfully, listeners, I, I'm trying to answer the question, not be off. Like, I'm going to go around the block to make a point. So let's just say uh, I had a client that was um, intimidated by the leadership. She was trying to get promoted and get her that first rung of leadership. But she was very intimidated by the leaders that she had to interact with. Didn't really understand why. And what I did with her was I just asked her a set of questions. She would say, I just don't feel comfortable being in front of Crystal. Let's just use mm. that hypothetical name. I'm making that up. Okay. And I said, well, what do you think it is, Crystal? She answered the question. Then I said, so why do you think that was the answer? She said, oh, because Crystal seems like she's very closed. That's what she said, okay? She's Mm -hmm. very closed. I said, so why does her being closed affect you? She said, I don't like when people are that way. And I said, so why do you think you don't like it when people are that way? Well, because they seem like I can't understand where they're coming from. Okay, so why does not understanding where someone is coming from affect you? Yeah. Well, because if I don't know where they're coming from, I can't trust them. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it when I can't trust them. So why do you think that that's an issue for you not being able to trust somebody? Well, because when I was younger, Ooh, boom, there, there it is. is right? <laughs> there it so is. That's good. It, 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 what the work will allow you to do is to really ask the right questions because sometimes what we do in general and culture, I think it's a cultural thing for yes. America specifically, but I do think it's global too. And with the culture work with you outside of the country, I do think that there's, you know, um, People are really used to just giving a pat answer. Yeah. It's a pat answer, right? That's the answer. And that's just where it is, right? Or there's only one answer to the question. Mm. You gave me, you asked me the question. So really, stuff is very fluid and complicated yeah. and multiple pieces to it. Um, and so sometimes when you really ask someone a question, they haven't really thought about their answer or ever had to figure mm. it out. So to go back to your question, Myra, or the yeah. question from the audience, I don't think there's a there's one answer to plug into the square peg into the square hole of okay you go back four months ten months twelve <laughs> years you know, I, there's not an answer it really is more about engaging and allowing yourself to think about why yeah why do I not like X because I have a problem with people that for uh, I used to let me be let me be clear I used to be triggered by people that I perceived as not being honest. 
mm-hmm. about something. Let's just, I saw you pick up the paper before I walked in the room. And I said, oh, well, not that this is a problem. I say, oh, what paper is that? Oh, it's nothing. That would push my button when I was a lot younger in my career. Mm-hmm. Now, I, had, I went to therapy and found out what that was about, but it wasn't until I started doing personal work that that represents inauthenticity to me. Uh, inauthenticity means I can't. If mm-hmm. I can't trust you, then I, then I can't depend on you to help me or support me or tell me the truth. You get it? So yes. I had to figure out what my stuff was. So there's not a definite answer to it. But one of the things about the NOTRA method specifically as a, as a bridge to understanding yourself um, it's a curated process. So I take things from a lot of leadership development, soci- sociology, psychology, culture. Yes. It's curated in a way. But it really is personalized or bespoke for the individual person. So your coaching wouldn't look like, Taylor's coaching wouldn't look like, you know, um, my coaching wouldn't look like someone else's coaching. Because it's really your own perspective and how you're engaging. Yeah. And we teach you how to look objectively at things. Not... Well, my mama said X is not right, or <laughs> right. they said X. That's how you treat everyone. Again, golden rule culture yes. mindset. It really is gaining more understanding. That's how why we teach about curiosity, asking questions, understanding why you feel the way you feel. Not to change your belief system. Not to now you believe in abortion and you mm-hmm. didn't last week. It's not that level of depth. You, now you're a Democrat and you used to be a Republican or vice versa. Yeah, it really is the and why are you a Democrat? Why are you a Republican? Why do you believe and think what you believe? Yeah. A step deeper than just because someone else said so. Mm-hmm. A little bit deeper. So um, I hope that answered the question. I know I said it a did. lot. It did. No, it that was good. I have one more um, from the audience. And when you were talking about relationships and triggers and, and things like that, Um, Someone's asking about abusive relationships that, you know, during COVID especially, you know, we've read some things about those types of things are elevated or escalated even, Um, you know, being in confined conditions can serve almost as a catalyst for an increase in abuse in relationships. So if you're already in a relationship that's unhealthy in the home and, and you now have to spend all this time um, with the person, you know, what are some of the things that, if you are potentially in an abusive relationship that you can do to maybe deal with that, that, that may um, come from being self aware or, you know, how, how, and I know it's a tough one, but, but maybe what are some things or ways we can think about it? So I'm going to give layers to it. Cause that's how I talk. You know, I'm going to always give like five different perspectives. Cause it depends. Right. And you said it's curated. Well, it depends. And here's how I'll offer it to you. So I'll throw some multiple things out there, right? So they're abusive relationships, and I'm going to make it kind of general. I know there's more nuance than what I'm going to say, but just kind of go with me, right? Okay. Audience and guys. So there's multiple types of abusive relationships. There's an abusive relationship where the abuser is just physically overpowering you. You are scared for your life, and there's physical, very violent physical abuse. There's emotional and verbal abuse that's more psychological and, you know, yelling and screaming and hollering, you know, that type of thing. So there's a safety issue kind of abuse, right? Then there's that psychological that's still bad and not good for you to be in, Mm -hmm. but there's that level. There's layers we have to consider children in the space. There's layers we have to consider, you know, do I have money to live on my own if I leave this person? Are they going to? So there's so many layers to understanding physical abuse. But if there's one bright spot that I can walk this line, because this is not about ever, 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 ever blaming the victim. Because like I gave the example with you kicking, which was actually violent, but kicking Taylor, Mm -hmm. right? That's an example. If we start thinking about the bad situations we're in, whatever those are, and we find our little sliver of hope, support. So if you're isolated and nobody knows about it, Mm. maybe there's an opportunity to consider how you can just at least step one foot out of your toe in the water and just maybe talk to somebody that might be able to help you. That could be one option potentially. Yeah. Another option would be um, if you're not in a physically uh, dangerous situation, because I think physical abuse kind of trumps everything, does it not? Like it trumps everything. Yeah. But if let's say your abuse is more uh, bullying or threatening or that type of, you've never been hit or you've never been, or maybe you've been just nothing that is like physically um, to the extreme where you really have to protect yourself physically. 
um, even though all of it is bad and dangerous. Then there might be another step that you might build a network of support where maybe you can, you know, try to find a path on how to move yourself away from the situation. Mm. But it is so nuanced and so personal that it's really hard. And when I hear people giving a direct answer about certain things, mm -hmm. it makes me bristle a little bit because you really have to know the person and the dynamic of the relationship to truly give a, a answer that can help a person specifically. There's not a square peg, square hole answer for people that are in abusive relationships because the reason they're connected is so different for every person although Absolutely. the manifestation might be the same of the violence mm -hmm. or the manifestation might be the same of the emotional psychological abuse or the economic abuse mm -hmm. right so it, it i don't want to say it can depend and sound glib i want to say if the person that is in the position feels a level of huh they hear this information they think huh I think I might not have taken advantage of some of the options uh -huh. I might have. Boom, there you go. Yes. If so, you've been keeping it a secret from your family, maybe that might be a step for you. Does that yes. make sense? Yes. So, you know, thinking about what you can feel comfortable controlling, because I would never advocate, just pack yourself and leave. Mm -hmm. That's not the best thing to always tell someone, right? Yeah. Or they may truly love their abuser and they may not understand and they may see, oh, they're in pain or they, so that might be a limit or two. So you just don't know what someone's foundation mm. is mm -hmm. in terms of how to give a direct answer. So I hope it doesn't sound. It, no, you know. it's, it's great. And there is a follow up question, if I can, Go ahead. Um, just around why people may stay. And I think you kind of got into it a little bit when you were talking about maybe you love that person and, um, <clears throat> it may be that it's non-abusive, but but this question is around when someone knows they need to leave a relationship, why would they stay? Or why do, you know, it's a common behavior that people stay? Let's answer it in terms of there's abuse and that concern about abuse. And there's people that are in the wrapped up, you know, codependent, dysfunctional mm. relationship within, within abuse or that's either psychological, economic, or physical. Okay, we're going to put that on one side of the line. Yeah. Let's just talk about this in a relationship that you just need to leave it, right? Yeah. There may be some abuse happening, but it's not uh, to the level that you couldn't still control yourself or take advantage of taking care of yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great example of uh, where you're not necessarily being victimized, but you're genuinely unhappy. I think you have to really start with yourself. Why are you with this person? Mm -hmm. Oh, because we got along so well five years ago, mm -hmm. okay? And why was it so good five years ago? Well, because, you know, he was doing well and I was doing well or they were doing well and we were doing well or, you know, she and I loved each other so much and whatever that reason is. Oh, okay, so why were you so in love then? You see how you can just, yes. again, back in thinking through for yourself or mm. reaching out to someone that can, you know, why was it good then? When did it start going bad? Well, it started going bad when I got a new job, or it started going bad when I lost my job, mm -hmm. or it started going bad when he didn't get, she didn't get, they didn't get, you get it? Like, yes. It's really thinking through how you got to be where you are. And is it your truth that you don't want to be there? Or is it that you want your partner to be a certain kind of way for uh -huh. you to feel good, which is codependent? Yeah. Oof. That was good. Right? You dropped a, a some few way gems. Because with our yeah, partner. Say what now? That was really good. I said you dropped a few gems. I want you to finish your thought, though. <laughs> well, I'll just say this to end it. Sometimes when we think about, you know, leaving people, right, because there are plenty of folks that are divorced and in love with each other. There are plenty of folks that love people that they're divorced from. Mm -hmm. Plenty, right? So love is really not the thing that keeps you connected to another human being. That's true. Right? As a general statement. But I do think if you can ask yourself, self, why am I with this person? Am I with this person because if they, I want them to treat me a certain way for me to feel good, hmm. or they have to do it a certain kind of way, or why do I have to have it that way? Again, we're not talking about economic, psychological, and physical abuse. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about a bad relationship, right? So whether it's the stereotypical old school ones running around and doing bad stuff and all that, that's something you might want to consider. What's it about for you that you accept it, right? Mm -hmm. If it's this person's not the level I want them to be or they're not acting the way I want them to act or they're not being the way I think a partner should be, why do you feel that way and why is it your belief system? Again, mm -hmm. why is it your belief system? Not in a punitive, shaming way. I'm very big on not promoting shaming 
and uh, punitive mindset and limiting beliefs of I'm a bad person because I don't do X. We mm-hmm. really promote that it is what it is, and we're not going to add shame and negativity to that understanding of yourself. Love that. I think that's a, that keeps us sometimes too from dealing with their pain. So, yes. I mean, I, I think that, again, if you start with yourself, that's the thing you can control no matter what. You can control yourself. Yeah. And that's why I think self-awareness work is so powerful. And mm. it's a very, uh, what we say in the Notre method, and the reason why we say it is because somebody else said it at one of our meetings. And we were leaving a meeting, and one of our clients, we hadn't met. At, this is a group like maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, and the, one of our members came in, and she we had not met for two or three months because, you know, it was holidays and children graduating from high school. It was like we had a lot going on in the group, mm. okay? And uh, we got together, and she was having a really rough time. And she came and she said, okay, I need group today, y'all. I just got to tell y'all about what's going on. And I need some accountability and all that. Because we're mm-hmm. big on accountability, too, with the Notre Method. And so she said, uh, when we left, it was like six of us in, in the kitchen um, putting things away. And she said, you know what I love about the Notre Method is no one in your life has to change for it to work. Ooh. She said, when I came in, and my man is still doing what he's doing. My son is still doing what he's doing. And my daughter still doesn't know what she want to do. And I'm upset about that. But I literally feel better because I was able to be accountable for what I can control. And I have the support and accountability of y'all. Not to, We're not rubbing on her like girlfriends. And I'm not diminishing half the power of your girlfriends or people in your life that love on you. We really were there to work and talk with her about what her values and what her goals were. And she could circle back on that understanding to then go back and treat her husband a different way that meets his needs because she's already told us what they were, but her button was pushed. She couldn't uh-huh. do that for him. To talk with her son in a different way instead of what she wanted, engage him in a way that could get more information from him. Mm-hmm. So she felt empowered to go back and change the situation or try to influence it to the health of what she thought for, she wanted for her family. But nobody changed with her coming to group and leaving group within two hours. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so... And, and we all started crying like immediately. I, I just think it was God moving because we all got emotional by that statement because it is an empowering feeling for some of us that do this work to know that you can be in control of yourself. With Gosh. your, in such if you have a deep relationship with God and you pray, like I, I, that's part of my my walk and how I live my life. I think that that combination is just so amazing. It's just so deep. You know, I love that. So, um, we can. I don't know if we need to go on that, well, but uh, we may have time. We, yeah, to, we're going well, to actually the, no, we're we going to get to this last question. Um, even though it's eight thirty, and then we'll do like a little wrap. We'll do a little wrap. But um, that was a success story in and of in itself, um, and that happens to be our next question. Um, what are some of your success stories with people that practice your method? Obviously, that story with that lady that said that powerful thing. I fixed all of my issues and nobody had to change but me. Mm-hmm. So um, if I right. regurgitated that correctly. But what are some other some but success she stories? Felt more in control of them. Yeah. More in control and not so out of control and just so helpless. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a couple. I'll give you a corporate I'll give you a corporate example and I'll give you uh, or a corporate or business example. I'll give you a personal example for myself and then I'll give you um, I had a husband call me the first the first compliment that I ever got and I'm not going to get emotional was in this same cycle of this group about seven years ago this is when I was getting more into doing professional groups and we were you know it was more organized around my business more so um, than just being more social and outlet for women to connect um, a husband called me a very astute um, you know kind of buttoned up guy mm. you know and he, was, he had tears in his voice. You know what that means when people, when people say that you have tears in your voice, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And he had tears in his voice. And he said, listen, I know you don't know me well, but you've been meeting with my wife for however how long. And I don't know what you ladies over there talking about every weekend, but let me tell you something. Thank you for giving me back my wife. Mm. I don't know what y'all talking about, but my wife is a different person. That's a powerful testimony. Wow. It is. And, you know, I have seen him now, you know, several times that we always have this connection. When I get emotional thinking about that, because you know how deep that is when yeah. people, because like I say, there are plenty of folks that love each other that aren't married. 
They can't make it work or stay yeah. together or stay committed to each other. You know, and sometimes, not every time, but sometimes it's just our junk. Yeah. Your partner's junk, your junk. And it just, it keeps butting up against each other over and over. Um, another example was uh, a professional example that happened with an executive. She was an African-American executive. I mostly work with people of color because that's my passion, but I serve everyone who wants to be served. Mm -hmm. But my passion is to be that our community, but everyone is welcome. Um, she was about to actually get, lose her job because she was very in her head and very quiet a very deep thinker and very untrusting of other people but mm -hmm. that she was so successful at her job and the companies merged and so the new people just could not get along with her mm -hmm. and a lot of the old school people that were white males that had her back they were gone they retired or moved on to other companies she had no more cloud cover to be herself and get mm -hmm. the job done right so I got a call from their executive leadership team and they were like, look, we have this person, we need you to coach her. Mm -hmm. Well, once we started doing the work within weeks, I mean, she would just text me for me to be like, girl, this stuff is the bomb. I said what you said to say. It was amazing how much it worked. I see what you're talking about. Like, it just was like, she said, I don't know why no one has ever told me uh. that the way I see the world, I'm projecting it onto everybody else, expecting them to do wow. what I needed to do. When wow. really work is not about that. Work yeah. is about doing your job and meeting the standard of being a team player. And it's hard when you're a person of color and a woman, right? Yeah. But the skills made her feel more empowered. So that was just such a rich, and she has referred so many people to me. So wow. many people to me as a result of experience with, the, with me. Beautiful. Um, with the Notre method, not me, but it's the Notre method, the process. Um, and then on my own personal experience, um, when I started this business, you know, I was going to go back to school and get a PhD and get a master's and, and do all these things. And I was very stressed out about not having been a big time executive because I really don't help executives. I don't teach you how to be an executive. I'm helping executives know themselves so they can be more effective with who they serve. Hmm. Uh -huh. It's different. So I'm not, I don't need to be an executive or an astronaut or a physicist to help the physicist be a better person. But if they become a better person in terms of how they see themselves and they know themselves, they can be a better physicist or astronaut or executive. That's mm -hmm. the point of the Nozer Method. That makes sense. Yes. I research leadership to the nth degree. I mean, I think people get sick of me researching leadership. But um, the sun is going down. I'm losing my life. Um, <laughs> but I got a uh, – the, the, the last one that I will tell you is for myself, when I look at where I've come from with an idea – about how to help the black community heal their pain and have feel more in control. I feel that our company in this process plays a role in helping us heal because it empowers us to take control of it mm -hmm. and stop the power of people. Yeah. And this is not oversimplifying. It's work, but I definitely think it's good. I'm going to turn the light on before we get rid get done, guys. Let me turn the light on. Okay. <laughs> I think we're we're Are, good yeah. to wrap. Maybe yeah, you get that some was a, any that was, final thoughts yeah. or yeah. Why don't you give us a, your final thoughts and um, we'll hear from Myra and how this uh, worked with her. Let's try something different and I'll take it from there. Yeah. And send us home. So you have any final thoughts, Tia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I turned on the light. I didn't know you were talking. I thought you were talking. Okay. My final thoughts. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's um, okay. So. What I would offer is, I know this conversation kind of, we kind of got into the mix of it, and we really didn't have a lot of, like, you know, set up. Usually when I'm presenting to people, I do some videos, I kind of get some prompts on where we are in culture, why it's important for you to understand yourself, and we kind of build up to that. Mm -hmm. Then we just jumped into the middle, we kept it more on the personal, personal side than professional. But what I would like to say as a final thought is, if you look in your own eyes every day and you know you're not where you want to be, living the life the way you would like to live it. You probably have more control over your life than you might realize. And if you add in your faith, your belief systems that are healthy and helpful to you, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful combination. Self-empowerment yeah. in a way that is tactical and literal and helping you relate to others better yeah. is a gift to your So that's just what I can end it on that note. Awesome. And, and I'd awesome. like to say this. We're in the fourth industrial revolution. 
And in that fourth industrial revolution, IoT or the Internet of Things mm -hmm. is going to connect our world in a way that is unprecedented. And there are a lot of operational behaviors that we've done in work in the 20th century that is no longer effective in the 21st century. Mm. So human only traits will continue to go up in value as operational repetitive behaviors and work go down in value because technology will be able to do that. Automated tellers, mm -hmm. automated select Walmart, automation is the future. Mm. So the better you are with your human only traits, engaging, relating, interacting, understanding yourself, those people, those people with that skill will have more opportunity as we move forth in our world. Wow. Yeah. We're global, not just about America, as we can all see from the COVID situation. Yeah. It's about the world. So we're in this situation. Think about companies that could not pivot. What are they doing? Yeah. But the companies that could pivot are doing some different things. So evolving is really going to be very important as we move forward. And technology becomes more part of our day-to-day -day life in ways that we have not even considered. Tia, so you are, yeah. Um, against that. Yes. Um, I was going to say, Tia, you are brilliant. Um, yeah. You have a deep grasp on your your craft. And it has just enlightened me in so many ways. I have so many gems and just nuggets and things that I can pull from. And so I, uh, I hope, I know this was an introduction, there's so much, and like you said, it's very curated, it's very complex. Um, but I hope it gave our audience an, an, an intro into, into what you do and what you offer. How can they find you or follow up with you if they want more information? Well, um, please feel free to give them my, my phone number. They can definitely call me directly. But I'm on um, LinkedIn is probably the best way. I okay. am on Facebook, but I'm not, I don't go to Facebook as much. But really, LinkedIn is a great way to find me. And it's just my name, as you see on the screen, Tia Buckham White um, on LinkedIn. Um, but my cell phone number, can I give it here in my email? Or do you guys want to hand it, give that out in a different way? Taylor, how should we do that? You can, you can, just everybody get your pen and paper, get ready to write down her cell phone and email. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so just my email. Cell number is just email. My business number. If you want, so just email. Just email. Okay. So the name of my company is at the bottom of the screen. It's Notra International, and so it's uh, N O T R E International is the name of the company. Um, you can go to our website, um, which would be notrainternational dot com. But my email address is my initials. So my name is Tia Buckham White. So T B W at notrainternational.com perfect please reach out to me I'm happy, I'm happy to interact with anyone um that has any questions or any information um if there's anything else you guys need taylor you know that i love and support your family with everything i have myra you know you and david are my folks love you we appreciate you so yes, much we love you, my <laughs> all of you guys thank you so much and like i said anything that wasn't clear or I got too deep in the weed. I'm happy to. <laughs> you did exactly what you were. Every message, it hit someone that needed it. Yes, I know for there sure. Was, there, was no, sure. There, were no, there were no too deep moments. Huh? There were no too deep moments at all. No, I think everything uh, was very resonant. So let's begin with this or end with this. We got to have you back. Yes. We'll come up with something more concentrated since you're such a... Uh, Wikipedia, <laughs> walking Wikipedia and a uh, plethora of information. So we'll concentrate things so that we can be a little bit more specific. But um, I think in closing, the power of asking yourself your own questions will mm -hmm. dramatically change your life. Mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of trying to blame everyone else, instead of trying to not take accountability, First, start with you and ask yourself questions about why things are the way that they are. Because in all of your life, in all of your relationships, you are the common denominator. Mm -hmm. We want to thank Ms. Buckham White, yeah. um, obviously our lovely Myra Herring, Mr. David Herring <laughs> in the back, and all of you for watching. We're going to bring Tia back um, here and we're going to have another conversation. 
But remember, self-awareness is uh, a gateway to more powerful living. God bless you. Go in peace. We thank you for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Tia. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. You'll be back. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs>